about this, but give you a perspective for a minute, because sadly, I probably cannot give you definite answers. I hope together we can come up with some good guidelines. And so let me tell you, I thought about why can't I give you a good answer? Well, I think there's a problem here. When I teach the law of search and seizure, when can you stop a car, when can you frisk somebody, when can you take someone's DNA, I'm dealing with law that was developed in the 1780s, right? So not real science focus. Well, what we all know, those of us from the states in the area of criminal law, is called the Brady Obligation, right? We've all at least heard that, was developed in a non-science context also. Footnote here, Brady was actually a death penalty case, and the issue didn't have to do with guilt or innocence. The issue had to do, should Brady get the death penalty because he was the shooter, or was there some evidence that he was guilty, but the other guy was the one who actually fired the gun? Interesting stuff, but not really science. So what we're doing is taking some principles, just like in the search and seizure area, that were developed with science way off the, you know, not on the plate, and now saying, OK, Let's apply it to science. So we're going to try that together. And I hate to say this, but the same is true when we get to the talk about ethics. Um, a lot of scientific organizations have ethical codes, but when we look at them a little later, they have nothing to deal with this situation because nobody ever thought about it. So what, given those limits, I'm going to answer all your questions perfectly, um, maybe. So OK. I, as a non-scientist, had to even figure out what this stuff meant so I could then tell you what your obligations might be. And so it was, OK, what's the problem? All right, that goes, I'm old. That's Bob Dylan. Those of you who are too young, ask your parents who Bob Dylan was, OK? But he said, the times, they are a changing. And I don't know if the times are changing. So you saw that I put the word new up there in quotes. Are they really new? Or are they just clarifications, elaborations, reminders of, hi, this is how you should have been doing things all along? And so I'm just trying to phrase on this. How do we even think about this? How do we label this? I don't even like the word problem, so let's use the word issue. So it's, are they really new? Does it actually undercut earlier testimony or earlier reports. So I had asked for some help. Again, I'm not really a science person. To say, what are they? And this is an explanation that was given to me that has informed how I wrote this. So if the explanation is wrong, everything else is wrong. Sorry about that. But at least you'll know where I started from. What's the problem? We already had interpretation guidelines. Uh, apparently, allegedly, they were not detailed enough to provide good guidance. And the new guidelines go into considerable detail to include practical examples. All right, so, so far, it doesn't seem you know, like the, uh, the Earth has been knocked off of its axis. OK, and here it is. Again, they're nothing new. This is how the community, uh-oh, should have been handling them all along. Well, the word should have been handling implies, oops, maybe some of us weren't. OK, so now we're sort of getting to the root. And again, forgive me, but I like pictures, and they're all really stupid. Um, some labs are now recognizing that they may have really, and I, I exaggerated, the really overestimated the rarity of DNA profiles. I assume at least that's a possibility in some cases. What percentage, what degree of overestimation, whether in any particular case it makes a hoot of difference, because the guy's also caught on videotape, you know, that's another issue. But just in isolation, a concern that, hey, if we were to use the newest version of the guidelines, we might have different numbers than we did when we calculated them originally. OK, so I said, all right, well, that's interesting. But who the hell is Swig? Or I shouldn't say hell. I was thinking, oh, God. Oh, God. Did I say that? OK. Who the heck is Swig Dam? OK. And now, I happen to know who's who. Who? Jack is. No. OK. It's his fault. Um, you know, but 
So what that A group called Swig Dam came out and did this? Is that law? So one of the questions you all have to ask as you inform yourselves is, is Swig Dam law? Is it um, what we'd call compelling authority, good advice, or just one of many ways of approaching this problem? I can't answer that question for you. That's really for you within the profession. Um, but that's going to be a question you have to keep in the back of your minds as you try and decide, what does this mean? Maybe the answer is easy, because if the answer is simply, who cares what they are, but we're going to follow it, it then gets you to the next step. But I assume that there are diversities of opinions and approaches. I certainly heard today there are different approaches. I had no idea what you people were talking about for the last six hours, but it was really interesting to sit here and, you know, John would say, okay, we'll just erase this. I'm like, what do you mean you just erase this? Okay, but you know, I'll just erase this and put an F in. Oh, that feels better. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. Okay, I'm trying to learn this stuff. All right, so now let's get a little bit more serious. What does it actually say? It's a guidance document. Oh, okay. So it's not a law, it's a suggestion, it's an approach. It provides guidelines, but look at the last bullet. The revised guidelines are not intended to be applied retroactively. What does that mean? And more importantly, and I'm going to say, heck, who the heck is Swig Dam to say that? Because my view as a law head, right, as a person coming at this from an approach of a, a law professor or somebody thinking about the consumers at the end, right, the courts, the fact that Swig Dam says not to be applied retroactively, the great authority, Epstein, which is at least a good authority as Swig Dam, says that's hooey, okay? And let me tell you why it's hooey. Because the law decides, and this is, look, science and law do not always go well together. You all know that quite well, right? But the law will decide the significance so that although Swigdam can say, let me sort of understand what they mean. These aren't meant to be applied retroactively. Let's go forward. The fact that a respected entity, a body of authority in the world of DNA has said, hi, do it this way henceforth, raises a legal issue. What does that mean about how you did it before? So whatever the Swig Dam advisory of these are not intended to be applied retroactively means in the science community, please don't hang your hat on that in terms of the law community. Because I just don't think you can say that. Uh, or say it in the sense that that's in any way binding on a judge or on what are the duties that we're going to start talking about. So. All right, a brilliant jurist, okay, or you Utes, all right. What are the legal questions? Okay, well, one question is, in any particular case, each of you has a universe of cases that you've handled, would this make a difference? Well, I don't know. If the numbers dropped from 1 in 3,800 to 1 in 2,600, does that make a difference? It's hard for me to say. I don't know what other evidence was present in that case. I don't know, um, you know, maybe there was a guilty plea in that case. I can't begin to answer, but that's a very narrow question and something beyond this lecture because it is, again, case specific. You might look at 10 cases and say, God, the change in numbers is minuscule and there were three other pieces of evidence, and, and who cares? But it may make a difference in some cases. I'm going to use the word material, okay? Because we're going to come to that in a minute when we talk about the law of Brady versus Maryland and information that is material. And when we answer those questions, then we say, okay, what do we do with that? Well, is this something that's affected by the Constitution? 
The second one, statutory, I'm not going to answer because that would be from state to state. If your state has a law that says, hello, when science, I, I can't believe they have such a law, but if they had a law that says when science changes, you know, when you start a new thing, you have to go back and look or you have to disclose it, okay, well, that's a statute and you're stuck with it. I suspect it's nowhere in any statute book. But then the other one we'll talk about a little bit is about ethics, professional ethics, scientific ethics, sort of fairness, what feels good in your stomach. All right, so the Brady, and it was not these Bradys, obviously, but again, I was kind of stuck for what picture to put up there, Brady versus Maryland. And so I want to talk about what the obligations are, because again, we're stuck here in the late 1960s. I think that's when Brady was. And we're taking something that had nothing to do with science. Who shot the gun? That was the issue. Did the prosecutor play hide the ball on some evidence that said maybe Mr. Brady was the accomplice, not the actual trigger man? That's all. How does that help us answer this? Not a lot. But we have to try and glean from Brady and the uh, subsequent cases what the law might be. Okay, well, what's part one? A prosecutor, look at the words, may not conceal. Now, I realize I should have put another word in red there. The accused. Old cases, we're not talking about accused, right? They're convicted now. And we're going to talk about, is there actually a constitutional difference in the Brady obligation for current cases versus old cases? All right? May not conceal what? Evidence that could negate guilt. The rest of it, we're not really worrying about reducing the crime because the DNA evidence we're talking about is, were you there or weren't you there? Not what degree of offense it is. And that the law, the constitutional holding in Brady, said, we're going to call that kind of information exculpatory information. So, okay. Are we concealing anything? What does conceal mean? Does conceal mean hide the ball? Or does conceal mean I didn't affirmatively call you up and say there's something new? Not a clear answer yet. Let's go on. The court in a subsequent case, again discussing the Brady obligation, said, well, it's not just stuff like somebody else did it. But impeachment evidence, evidence that could undercut a witness's credibility. Simple illustration, not a science case. The government witness testifies, and the government never discloses that the witness has a conviction for perjury. OK, well, that's important to judge that witness. All right, well, here's the question. Is this impeachment evidence? You came into court or you wrote a report three years ago or your agency did that said uh, the random match probability or whatever those different formulas you had up here today was one in X. Oh, now we have two kinds of impeachment here. First, we have an official report from SWIGDAM that says, hey, a lot of you guys weren't doing it right. That itself is sort of impeachment information. Maybe. And then if you do the recalculation and say, my God, the number is different. That's impeachment information as well as traditional exculpatory information. So we have to start thinking about that. Here's another one. I don't think this is knowingly false testimony, but to cover all of the um, parameters of Brady, all right, the prosecutor may not knowingly make use of false testimony. Again, I'm not saying that's here, but we're just teasing out what the Brady rule is. When a prosecutor, okay, well, you guys say, oh, thank God that's not me. I'm not the prosecutor, I'm the lab person. Well, we'll get to that one in a minute because it gets a little stickier. When the prosecutor knows that false testimony has been presented, he or she must correct it. Okay. Uh-oh. Several years ago, the US Supreme Court said, we, we better explain who exactly the prosecutor is. And they held that the duty of disclosure extends to police agencies 
involved in the investigation and prosecution of the case, even where the actual trial prosecutor is unaware. The theory there was actually to put the pressure on prosecutors to go out and say to the police or the lab people or whoever, hey, give me everything. Tell me what's in that file because I can't play see no evil, hear no evil. If you and the police department or you and this investigating agency have some, let's go back to that word, exculpatory information, turn it over. And if you don't, the case is going to get reversed just as quickly as if I, the prosecutor, himself or herself had it. So what's pretty clear to me, if you're not a private lab, then we get even more in the sticky thickets of you're a private lab, but you have a contract, who knows what's going on. I believe that this case says police and police labs, I assume, state labs, are in the Brady umbrella. Okay, so where does that leave us? Is this Brady? I come back to the question. All right the existence of new or just clearer guidelines? Does that existence mean, that's why I put the question mark there, the old interpretation, I mean old in the sense of from an older case, might have been done wrong? And again, does it matter how wrong? If instead of one in 3,600, it's one in 3,599? Are we gonna fight over that? I don't know. There's no metric I can give you. There is no metric a court has ever said that it, it has to be at least a 10% difference. I don't know. But these are the concerns. Now, let's go farther. Further. One of those, okay? Brady was a rule for people in the pre-trial setting. Hi, we're getting ready for trial. Let's have a fair trial. Hey, prosecutor, if you've got stuff, turn it over. Okay. Does Brady apply to old cases? I hate to tell you this one. I can't give you a definitive answer on that. Why? This is language from a 1976 U.S. Supreme Court decision. Now, it's weird because they say trial. This is due process. That's the Constitution. Post-trial. The prosecutor is also bound by ethics. Is ethics the same as the Constitution? I don't know. They sort of put them together there, but seem to require some ongoing duty of disclosure. Well, I thought that was it until 2009. This is a case called Osborne. This is a case out of Alaska where Osborne was trying to force Alaska to let him do the DNA testing, and Alaska was saying, just follow our procedure, and there's a big, I, don't, I can't say this on tight, but you know what they were doing on each other, right? Okay? Nobody was playing fair. Everybody was just going at it, and, and no one was getting down to the issue. But the court said, we have to decide, does he have a right under the Constitution post-conviction to get that DNA testing? And of course, his lawyers, okay, said, uh, one of them, Peter Neufeld from the Innocence Project in New York is the one who argued the case in the U.S. Supreme Court. One of their arguments was, Brady, come on, members of the Supreme Court, what about Brady? Well, this is what the majority opinion said. You have only a limited right after you've already been convicted. Brady is the wrong framework. Now, is that 100% controlling. I don't want this to get too much into a heavy-duty theoretical law school class mindset. There's an argument that this language is what we call dicta, sort of a, an aside, not part of the core holding. It's also Brady where the defense is trying to, if you will, create or get access to evidence that might be exculpatory. It also might be his DNA, right? So it might be inculpatory, as opposed to something that is clearly beneficial. So I don't know. But if you put those two slides side by side, 1976, yeah, there's some post-conviction duty. 2009, 
there's much less. That's why I say I can't come to you and say this clearly. So here was my um, sort of framework. Pre-trial, certainly. Pre-sentence, certainly. Post-sentence on the first appeal, what we call the direct appeal, Brady probably applies. Post-appeal, either during the post-conviction process or um, you know, after all it's over and the guy's been in jail 15 years, unresolved. That's the best I can tell you there in terms of state of the law. Okay, all right? And so when we go back to that language, in a sense, maybe Swigdam was right if Brady doesn't apply to post-conviction cases. So all I can say is it's a problem. I'm, I'm not sure you want to even fight that problem, and I'm going to talk about a way to resolve all of this mess um, a little bit later in the PowerPoint. But that's our Brady discussion. So let's, as we say, beyond Brady. All right, how about ethical codes? Well, the ABA printed model rules for prosecutors. Look at the red language here. When you, the prosecutor knows, learns of new credible evidence, creating a reasonable likelihood that a convicted defendant did not commit an offense. I hate to stop you here. Does that mean every single case? Or only ones where the statistics you did were the tipping point evidence? Right? Because if there are 50 other pieces of good evidence, maybe it doesn't mean anything. But who knows what this means, but this is the prosecutor's ethical duty. This is an ABA, American Bar Association, ethical uh, mandate. And so I don't think this applies to lab people, unlike the argument that Brady does. Okay, what do they have to do? Promptly disclose that evidence to the defendant, unless a court says, no, there's a reason to delay, and undertake further investigation. Okay, well, that was a wonderful rule, but guess what happened? Of the 50 states, only one has adopted it. Okay, so, all right, it's what we call hortatory. We're exhorting people to rise to this high level, but right now it's not even a professional standard in 49 states. Folks haven't moved. All right, so what about a lab's duty? Again, I don't think labs fit under the word prosecutor in that sense. Okay, ethics. Coincidentally, I got asked to do this thing after I was asked to write a book chapter for a, an upcoming book on forensics on ethics in forensics. So this is easy, now I'll just take the stuff I learned in the book. There wasn't a lot, okay? Why? Okay, because again, I told you, when forensics groups wrote their ethics codes, just like when Brady was decided, nobody was thinking about post-conviction. We hadn't had 270 DNA exonerations. This stuff wasn't on the radar, as best I can tell. There's not a single forensic organization that has any reference in its ethics code to once the case is over. So not a heck of a lot of guidance. Well, what about more general guidance? Okay, the American Board of Criminalistics. Ensure that a full and complete disclosure of the findings is made to the submitting agency. A submitting agency is the local police department or the prosecutor. That doesn't even say notify the accused. And certainly the way it was written seems to be talking about what? Pre-trial. Okay. Now, AFTI, uh, firearms tool, any firearms tool marks examiners here? One. There's always one in every crowd. Okay. AFTI's code of ethics is a little better. All right, John? You did better. Why? Because it says to seek justice at all times. Oh, that's incredibly clear to you now, right? Just seek justice at all times and you'll do fine. Good, we can end early and we'll all go to the beach. Oh, sorry, can't do that yet either. But that's, that's, that's the guidance we get from AFTI. Ask CLAD, don't engage in conduct that is harmful to the profession. By the way, that, that, they actually warned you, don't break the law. Don't you feel better now? Don't do anything illegal. Uh, the red stuff, any technical misrepresentation or distortion. Uh, you know, okay, 
when you wrote that report the first time, was there any technical misrepresentation or distortion? Or were you sort of doing custom and practice back then? I don't know, because if we were to turn all the way back to the early slides here, right? One of the comments was these newer guidelines were put out to clarify how you should have been doing it back then. But technical mi misrepresentation or distortion, is that what this is? Maybe. You know, I don't have a metric for that one either. And again, does that cover going back in the past? Not clear from ASCLAD. Okay. Now, all of that is about old cases. I want to take a minute because the law professor in me said, gee, what about new cases? What about the case tomorrow? What implications does the approval of the SWIG dam guideline or guideline revisions have? So let me do that briefly. Okay, here's the initial question. Are they solely a narrowing of earlier procedures or guidelines, or are they materially distinct? Why do we care? All right? Because the more different they are, you may be back to fighting the Fry or Daubert admissibility challenges. Now again, I'm not saying they are that different. I just tried to make sure I had enough slides for an hour, so I had to talk about this. But actually, in a serious sense, it's a question that comes to my mind, and it's a question borne out with some case law. Okay, this is a quote from 1992, where in California, we were still fighting some of the DNA wars of admissibility back then, all right, whether the interim and future methods of statistical calculation will be generally accepted. Okay, so they were asking questions about number crunching, right? Interesting question. Here's a case from Florida requiring a Fry hearing on changes between NRC 1992 and NRC 1996. All right, here's a California quote, 2003. All right, when they are materially distinct procedures, they must pass first prong scrutiny. I guess that means go back to a new Fry here in California has a modified Fry standard they call it Fry Kelly. So again, are these materially distinct procedures? Now why am I telling you this? Because sometime in your lab internally, or when you sit down with the prosecutor to prep a case, and I'll have a slide coming up about this, you're going to have to decide. Do we have the talk? Do I say, yo, you know, I'm dealing with new procedures. Um, do you want to be aware of that? Do you want to tell the opponent? Do you want to at least think about it, Ms. or Mr. Prosecutor, so that if they make a Fry challenge or they make a Dauber challenge, you're aware and you're alert and you know what's going on? All right? Now, so I asked, boy, if I was a prosecutor, what would I do? I could get ahead of the curve and say, Your Honor, um, in an abundance of caution, we've got this new procedure. Maybe it's not new, but I want to lay it on the table, and I'm going to ask Jack Ballantyne to dial in his testimony again. He can call from his office, all right, and testify, but I want to prove these are, and the Fry standard we know is general acceptance. Or do you do nothing and say, and, and, and listen, I, the, the last project I worked on for NIJ is DNA for the Defense, and we're putting together, and it'll be published in a few weeks, this massive resource book for defense lawyers. But you know, even from the prosecutors, and I'm sure you've seen it from the defense, 99% of them have no idea about any of this science, and that's a polite thing, right? Usually they're so, not just they know nothing, they know wrong things, right? And so they ask these ridiculous questions. So the odds, I'm saying this bluntly, of a defense attorney saying, aha, I'm aware of the new guidelines. I'm going to litigate a Fry motion. Unreal. OK, unless you have a really good, anybody here from Minnesota? All right, have you guys run into my friend Christine Funk? Oh, yeah, she's in, <laughs> OK. Again, because we're taping, I can't say anything. But you will confirm. <laughs> 
You can say it, but afterwards at the bar you'll say that, okay? But you can confirm that Christine Funk is a public defender who has learned DNA and knows at least what questions to ask, okay? But there are very few Christine Funks. The great majority of people have no idea what's going on. You hand them the report, they say to the defendant, there's a report, and then the case goes forward. I don't know, but people should be considering this. My question now to you is, okay, are you gonna call up your prosecutor and say, by the way, we're operating under new guidelines? Or are you going to say nothing? I don't have a good answer for that, although I suspect you ought to. Um, and frankly, I think it ought to be in your reports, which we'll talk about. Well, we know that some states have the Fry standard. We know that federal courts and the numeric majority of states use the Daubert reliability standard. Well, reliability challenges are always possible. Um, I'm not saying you're likely to get one, but you could. So what's the do it once right model? I learned this from a judge named Ron, who's here from Arizona? Oh God, I know you know this. A uh, Judge Ron Reinstein? Okay, Ron Reinstein, great judge, former prosecutor, now does a lot of consulting work. And when they were trying to decide whether to admit DNA back in the day, all the judges in Phoenix, Maricopa County, said, let's have one judge do a consolidated Fry hearing. It's really the right way to do it. I just participated in a similar type hearing on eyewitness issues in New Jersey. One judge, they had all the issues in front of that judge. What a great way to do it. Because you're not doing it piecemeal with people from different quality, okay? So I will suggest to you that if in your jurisdiction you fear or anticipate or desire having a hearing to resolve are these new guidelines reliable, are they generally accepted? Don't have 28 hearings in front of 28 judges. The system should be able to respond to do a consolidated hearing, do it once, do it right. Any lawyers who come afterwards, they get the same notes of testimony and they do it. It's, there's a model out there that people have used and it's worth considering. Okay, now, report writing. I'm working with National Institute of Standards and Technology on a latent print uh, task force, fingerprint evidence, and I'm on the report writing group. So I've started learning about lab reports and the difference between lab reports and case notes and bench notes and all this stuff. So the question is, at the bottom of your report, who was saying earlier, so one of our speakers was saying earlier that at the bottom of her report, it always says, what does the word source mean? Okay, a, a simple glossary. Well, do you put this in your report? We use the 2009 or 2011, whatever the number is, version of SWIGDAM guidelines for analyzing mixtures, as opposed to, the, uh, that, that would really give the hint, as opposed to the 2003 ones, right? Um, my gut is you ought to, um, uh, and I'm gonna tell you why. I don't think it benefits anybody in science to ever be accused of playing hide the ball. Now again, this is stuff you have to do at a policy level in each of your agencies. But I suggest to you that the more open you are, the more you put things out in the open, the more that you're the scientist that you are. Um, but that's something for you to do. And then the next question is, you know, do you let the consumers the defense lawyer, the judge, the prosecutor figure out what that means, but at least it's on notice. So it's something you ought to give serious consideration to. Okay, now I heard the, the saga of the terrible cross-examination, right, that you were subjected to, um, the painful cross-examination. So I just tried to think, what's gonna happen now when you are on the witness stand with these new guidelines? So I'm gonna show you the good, bad, and the ugly of those, just to give you something to think about in terms of what might come down the pike. Okay, what are the questions to anticipate assuming your agency does proceed along the new guidelines? Say, okay, we're gonna use them. So, you know, it's always that 
that's swarming. So, so, you're using new guidelines, right? Yes, you're right. That means your lab may have overstated results in the past. How are you going to answer that? I thank you. Okay, because that's the honest answer. Right? Yes. It may mean in a small number of cases. It may mean at an infi infinitesimal difference level. But it may be the answer is yes. Uh, again, I spent nights just trying to think up the one question, right? And most of the lawyers aren't going to spend their time doing that. But be aware, when you adopt something new, new and improved, say as well. Maybe we weren't doing it so well before. What's the next question? And when you testified in those cases, you used the same language, the stuff you use today, about, oh, I'm sure of this to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. You're dying over here. Look at you. He's sweating now. He's, he's never going to testify again. OK? All right, now, these are obviously. I have no defense in this case, right? So what can I do? Attack you. Um, but uh, those are fair questions. And so you ought to at least think about answers. My own attitude is that the right answer is yes. Uh, the guidelines, have, for the first one, it's something very simple. Yes. Uh, there may have been overstatement in a couple of cases. Go ahead. Then, then, you, then, you, then you go like this, right? <laughs> So, ha, ha, got you. You know, you rip the head off the chicken. You, know, you do the whole thing, right? No, I understand that. If you're doing them right, that's great. But, OK, you know, you, please hear me. This is what happens when lawyers ask questions that they don't know the answers to. So if your agency was doing it right, you're going to sit there so nicely and say, as a matter of fact, we were always following these methods, and we're even conservative when we do it. <laughs> you know, then you stick out your tongue, right? But all I want you to see is look at the kinds of things that when something new comes along, you have to understand that, and that somebody's going to try and exploit it. Just like, would you please give me a yes or no answer to what is not really a yes or no question? Okay, now, let's see. All right, Ooh, what happened? I'm, oh. OK, first, I have to repeat the question so they get it on the tape. And the question was, should we stop using the words to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? I'm not the expert on that, but I've been learning from some evidence scholars that there's actually no requirement in law to say that. Um, but that's a whole other issue. It's something worth talking about. Uh, it may be that the courts in your jurisdiction require that. But if you trace back the history, there's no real, there was no moment when you know, God with the 11th commandment said, and all lab analysts should testify to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. That hasn't happened. So the answer is maybe. OK, now, let's go back to the, you're using new guidelines. And that means your lab may have overstated results in the past. And my next question to you to make you squirm, if I'm the opposing counsel, is going to be, have you notified anybody of that? And how are you going to look when you say no? Now, again, I promise you I'm not like mailing these out to defense lawyers all around the country yet. OK. <laughs> um, you know, but I pose these because you are scientists. You know, when I, I gave a training here. We did the um, impression and pattern evidence symposium in August. And part of my training was training folks how to testify as an expert. And I, one of the things I said to you, when you get up and get credentialed, I want you to remember to say, I work in the lab that has found 80 people guilty, but has also exonerated five people, right? Because you guys do that all the time. You're neutral scientists. Well, this question is not going to make you look very neutral if the answer is no. And again, this is me preaching to you. You don't have to follow this, but be aware. This is a question I would ask. Now, a judge might say, objection sustained. 
Mr. Epstein, that has nothing to do with the case. But the damage is done. So be aware of the implications. Okay? What was wrong with the old guidelines? If nothing was wrong, why new? You know, you're going to get some questions like that. What if you don't adopt the guidelines? This goes to like the questions you were talking about before. Give us the name of all those smart people who are on that commission, right? And you're not using their method or who signed that report. Here's what it's going to look like. Tell the jury what sweet bam is. You agree, don't you, that it is a prestigious scientific group. You agree it's the leading research and best practices entity. You can just see where I'm going. I'm about to pull the rug out from under you. Your chair is going to fall over, right? Because they adopted new guidelines, didn't they? They were adopted after three years of intensive study, not just study, intensive. The FBI lab uses them. Other labs, Nate, come on, you know where I'm going. And you're not, are you? Right? I mean, you can hear in the tone of voice, OK? That doesn't look good. So it's something to be aware of. Again, this was just me putting on my litigator hat and saying, how is this going to muck things up? OK, it's going to, you know, those are possibilities. And you have to think about answers. OK. So I said there's a model approach, and I want to talk to you about something that has nothing to do with DNA. Who knows what CBLA is? Oh, good, I can tell a story. Comparative bullet lead analysis. OK, well, what is CBLA? Um, you take the bullet found at the crime scene, and you do some sort of metallurgical uh, assessment of it. OK, it's 80% copper and 20% lead. And I've already hit 100%, but we have a few more things in there. And then you take the box of bullets in the defendant's house. And lo and behold, they have those similar compositions. Well, the FBI lab was testifying to CBLA and then also putting numbers on it, probabilities. And it turned out that they'd never gone out and like done this numerical study of all the batches of bullets in the United States, say how many of them also had that same composition. So that I think it was in 2004 or 2005, uh, the um, National Academy of Sciences issued a report that said, there's a problem here. OK, well, and here's the background again that the FBI testified to it. There it is, the NRC did it in uh, 2004. So the FBI said, OK, we've been doing something wrong. We'll stop. OK, well, that's like, hi, we won't use the old guidelines anymore. Well, there are a bunch of people sitting in jail where some of the reason, certainly not all, but some of the reason was CBLA testimony. What did they do? The FBI took it first to what I'll call level one. They notified police and prosecuting agencies. Hi, you remember us? We're the ones who came up or down from Washington to testify about CBLA. There may have been a problem with the testimony. You should examine the case. I, I know that because I had a case where that happened and I got to see that, that this occurred. They sent out like a form letter as I recall it. OK, so they went to level one. Now, who wasn't notified there? The guy in jail or his or her lawyer. So what happened is as this developed, and it's really an interesting place where we are as a society nowadays, that the FBI can actually work. And I'm complimenting them and complimenting folks like uh, the Innocence Project and the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. They all got together and said, we'll jointly screen these cases and notify everybody. That's an incredible amount of work. It's a pain in the neck. But they created a model, and look to, at the bottom part, to vet cases and thereafter ensure that attorneys handling those cases had access to the, the knowledge. So I suggest to you, and I'm not saying that the switch from swig dam old guidelines to swig dam new guidelines is anywhere as extreme from use CBLA 
to don't. But it's the only model I know of, and it's worth thinking about. It can be much simpler. Now, it's a pain to those of you who are in the lab to have to go back and say, okay, in the last 10 years, how many cases were there where these guidelines were used? And then somehow sending out letters. But it's something you may want to think about to the extent you decide that there is a risk that some of those cases were overstated, and I'm going to go back to the word we used from Brady, in a material way. So it's an interesting motif. If you use that, who do you notify? The prosecutors, police agencies, I'd say at a minimum. Defense counsel, yes. Now, here's a, some other background stuff I need you to know. What happens if you don't? Well, uh, in many states, there are laws where a defendant who's already been convicted and is in jail and has exhausted all his or her appeals and post-conviction uh, procedures can claim, aha, newly discovered evidence. You say, well, OK, I don't have to worry, because the defendant will ultimately read about this and file a petition. And then we'll look at that case. Well, I, I suggest to you that that's not going to necessarily work. Number one, often there are time limits. Uh, in my state, Pennsylvania, uh, the rule is that that petition must be filed within 60 days of when the defendant discovered or reasonably could have discovered this information based on due diligence. Okay. What does it mean for a defendant to be able to discover it? I've seen courts say, that, well, there was a newspaper article on it. So that Mr. Schmo, who's sitting up in state prison up in Erie, Pennsylvania, somehow had access to the New York Times. I frankly think that's a myth, but that's a problem. So to the extent that we, as a community, say we want to be ethical, we want to treat people fairly, and maybe, uh, maybe of all the cases that everyone in this room handled, there's one where it might raise a question of innocence. You know, do we sit back and say, well, we'll hope the guy reads the New York Times or has access to the web and goes, checks the Swig Dam site periodically? Because some courts will say, aha, there was notice. Sorry, Mr. Defendant, too late. So the summary, okay. There may be, I'm not, I'm not going to say there were, cases where rarity of a profile has been overstated. Here we go. I can't give you the answer. I said it is an unresolved issue of the duty to go back and check whether we look at it in terms of the ethical standards we posted or the development of the law of Brady since 1967 or 69, whenever that case was. Um, what's the model approach? Again, my model, you don't have to agree, uh, is the CBLA model. I actually have one of those CBLA cases, and the truth is, in my case, it ended up not making a difference. But people learned about it, and that was the important thing. So that's an approach to be aware of, and here we go. Questions. I know we want to get to the beach, although I'm going to the airport in a few minutes, but I, I really do welcome either questions or comments. Um, am I Am I off base here on any of this? Does anybody have it? Please, and uh, bear with me, because uh, I, I told, was told you're all instructed to use the mic, and all of you ignore that. Oh, you will? That's so nice of you, because I shamed you. OK. <laughs> I'm just curious if you think that this is at all similar to a lab's own interpretation guidelines and how those change over time. Because like, if you look at the way we were doing a case 10 years ago, it's dramatically different than we're doing it now, regardless of what SWGDAM says. So does that, would you consider those similar? Or because SWGDAM is this entity, would you approach that differently? Because we're going to constantly be evolving, and we're not going to always, you know, we're learning, we're changing, we're, we're making things hopefully better. But does that mean what we were doing 10 years ago was wrong? That's what we knew at the time. 
Well, I, and, and do me a favor. A great question, and I want to take the word wrong out in the sense of wrong implies some moral wrong, okay? Because I happen to agree with you that when people apply the science as best as it was known at the time, there is no wrong. There may be insufficiency. This is a big debate in the exoneration world, where people say, oh, these people who were initially convicted, who DNA has now exonerated, uh, suffered from bad science. Some of them did when the scientists went beyond what could reasonably be said back then. A uh, hair comparison, one in 10,000 people. There are no statistics. You don't make up statistics. As opposed to, I'm going to tell you how old I am. When I started trying sex offense cases, we were still on the secretor, non-secretor method, right? I hadn't heard of DNA. It took a long time to get there, so I was an AB person, all right? So it's not that that's bad science. It's we testified to the limits of what science could do then. To me, the real question on that is still the same question. If after 10 years of doing it, your lab says, you know, we've got these new guidelines internal. And you know, if we had used these back then, there are a couple of cases where, my god, we might have come out differently. That, to me, is the issue, not the swig dam versus local, but ultimately the impact on outcome. Again, that's one person's, I hate to use this word, interpretation, but that's my view of that question. Somebody else, please. Please, and I'll ask. Yeah. The reason we want folks on the mic is because they're taping this. So yeah. please go ahead. Hey. Hi. It's more a comment on your answer to the question, which is there's always the potential, even with our current policies and procedures, if we go back and reanalyze a case, we may get different results or varying results, not even different, but different allele intensities, different allele calls. So it, it comes down to the question of what's valid. Is it valid what you do now, what you did 10 years ago, or what you're going to do 10 years from today? I, a great point, and said to a non-scientist, all I can do is nod my head and say, I hear you. And uh, look, you want a, a real answer? It, do what feels right in here. I mean, that's a completely non-law answer. It's you're going to know at some point that, sure, there's this, I'm going to call it a narrow range, where we retest, and it goes slightly differently. And we, but it's all within the, the range of satisfactory reliability, whatever the heck that is, OK? Then you're going to say, boy, you know, when I started out as an analyst x years ago, we were doing it this way. I can't believe I came up with some of those results in light of what I know now. When you get to that point, that's where I think it's a real issue. Other than that, like I said all along, I cannot give you uh, a a litmus strip, right? And say, put this in the water, and if it turns that shade of purple, that means that's the one that you have to disclose on. So you are right that what we are doing here is isolating a particular event, the new swig dam guidelines, right? When in fact, it's part of the scientific process, as you've explained it to me, that we're constantly learning and refining and improving. And so my only answer is, um, what, well, I have two answers. One is what I said before. Uh, ask yourself, is there a concern that on a particular case it might do it? I think that when it's at the level, and this sort of goes back to your question also, that when it's at the level of sort of a national change of policy, that beyond that, remember, my suggestion is not that you go back and retest anything. My suggestion, ultimately, is that you disclose. Hi there, new guidelines. Your case was evaluated under the old guidelines. If that gives you any pause, call me. And if somebody calls you up, you know, then you're going to see if you get 500 calls or two. To me, it's the disclosure aspect. But again, that's me. OK? Anybody else? Please, sir. One of the things with the new revised swig dam guidelines, uh, these are essentially peer-reviewed publications. Right. We essentially have peer-reviewed publications, 
every week. Do we put it on our list of a report every publication? It's got to be a point. There's revised, revised SWIG dam training guidelines, validation guidelines. At what point do we notify the prosecution? The point where it starts to make a difference. I, and again, you're asking, again, all these questions are the great science questions. I start at the beginning. It's like, don't shoot the messenger, right? I'm the one who said there is a rough fit between what happens in the lab and what people are looking at or for in a courtroom, okay? And my answer is, uh, there may be stuff in a peer-reviewed journal, but I'm not sure that's the issue. The question is, does it then change what you're doing and call into question what you did before? So my proposed answer to you, now that I've thought about it, is to narrow it to if there is some new publication that says, based on that, we're going to do things differently. Not just, hi, we also read Jack's latest article and it was really sexy and powerful and emotional because that's how Jack writes, okay? You know, it's not that, it's are we changing? And are we changing in a way that in some way calls into question what we did before? Uh, so is that, I, no answer is satisfactory, but did I do my best on that one? Um, <laughs> all right, we're going to get back to the microphone. No, I mean, horrible you know, answer. You talk about the, re, um, the FBI quality assurance standards. We've had revisions of those in the past. Do we, put, do we notify the agencies that there have been a, a revised in their standards? We changed our policies to comply with the new ASCLAD uh, standards, the new FQS standards, et cetera. I mean, I, I, you're asking a great question. Because one of the things you made a point is we need to notify the agencies, put it onto our report. But there are so many changes this happens in our, you cannot sufficiently notify of. Okay, and, and let me ask you, because I'll have to ask you, stay up there, stay up there, okay? Because I will ask you a question which will help me give you an answer. A lot of those things don't have to do with the report outcome. For example, ASCLAD may issue new guidelines on um, how often you do proficiency tests, just as an example. Uh, that's something that just goes in your SOP, and I know, who was it, from Virginia, you, you post, who was telling me, you post the SOP online. That, that's the easy way. A as opposed to something that's actually going to relate to reported results. I don't know if that helps at all, and I hear you, and again, look, I'm, I'm giving you a lawyer's opinion of trying to say, what are the questions? I'm not even going to predict what a judge would do if a defense lawyer, wh where are you from? This county. This, this county? Pinellas County. Okay. If a defense lawyer in this county came in the court and filed a motion to uh, set aside an old case or for a fry hearing here in Florida on the new guidelines, I'm not sure a judge would say that person even gets to first base. So I'm not trying to opine that this will definitely happen. I'm trying to do is identify what might and that each lab will have to make a policy determination as best it can of what do I do or what do we as a lab do for two reasons. For the one in a thousand individual who, for whose case that may make a difference, and for us to have a really good reputation as scientists. And to me, that's disclosed on both of those, and that's the best I can give you. But you're welcome to the last word. <laughs> no, I think full disclosure is a, a great idea. I just get, there's a point of... There's a point of, right, where you, we're you, disclosing all the time, we're you, not analyzing anything. Right, I mean, it depends upon how you're treating the, re the revised swig dam guidelines, and I use the word guidelines there. And, it, and again, to me, that also comes back to you, are you going to adopt them? If you do, what is the implication to you as a scientist? And if the implication is, had I used them earlier, I might have had a materially different outcome in a criminal case where it could have been the tipping point that brings us back. Okay? okay? 
Anybody else? Please step right up. I want you to see this, John. I've had four people ask me questions. No one asked you a question. <laughs> um, I just want your opinion. When we write a report and we're following our protocols at that time and the guidelines at that time, it gets sent out. Could be three years down the road by the time we testify to it. And recently, I went back to my previous lab to testify, or to that state to testify in a case that was written in, that I wrote in 2008. And their guidelines have changed since then, and I'm following new guidelines, uh, but I had to testify to following Swignum guidelines now, both at that lab and the lab I'm at now. But yet I'm testifying to a report that was written, obviously not under the new guidelines, because that's the protocol. I'm testifying to the protocols we were using then, and that we were using there. Now that potentially could happen in my current lab too, because we have changed kits, we've changed methods, just like someone else was saying, by the time you testify, you're testifying to what you did, not what you're necessarily doing right now. Even though you're saying, I follow all this when you're talking about, you know, all your qualifications and QA and in the opening of your testimony, and then you testify to your results, and your results necess aren't necessarily under following the new guidelines, it's what you had in place at the time. And, and here's the answer I have on that. There, there are really two parts to it. One is, if I were the prosecutor who you were testifying for, normally you testify mm -hmm. for the state, I would hope that you would tell me, hey Jules, uh, just so you're aware, we've got these new guidelines, I'm gonna give you the three minute tutorial on them, what do you want me to do? Because then the prosecutor might say to you, I hate to do this, but I'd like you to go back and rerun the numbers, we'll file a supplemental report, because I, as the prosecutor, don't want you or my case going down the tubes by your getting up there saying, oh, I, I did this in 2008, and then the defense attorney has actually learned this and said, hey, wait a minute, use the old guidelines. They've been replaced, and you're sitting up there, and you're actually saying, you know, I know they were replaced. I went to a, a wonderful resort to go to a lecture about that, except you'll leave out the resort part, because I understand that. All right, so how are you going to look? Yeah. So, but to me, that's between you and that prosecutor, just as a good scientist coming in to say, by the way, I tested these under this process, or I analyzed the numbers under this approach. Uh, there's a newer one. You should be aware of it. Um, in fact, you should be aware of it because God knows if this is a break. I mean, I don't know if you want to inject yourself to that level. Or you could just say it's our policy as lab people, we're telling you about this. It's up to you whether to disclose it. But I ran these numbers three years ago, the old way, which at the time we thought was perfectly good, be aware of the problem. That would be my answer as the way to deal with it so that, number one, I don't want you looking bad because you're up there and somebody sandbags you with the question. And certainly your first consumer is the agency that asked for that report. Um, just like if there were any other changes, you would disclose that to the person. Just, and I'm not trying to use this as a, a, a comparable example. Suppose you're the lab supervisor and you're called in because the actual analyst is no longer there. Well, if you know that one of the reasons the actual analyst is no longer there because he or, is because he or she was a problem, you're sure gonna go, hey, prosecutor, I better tell you this first. Do you want us to redo it? Stuff like that. I'm not suggesting this is akin to having a bad analyst, but the, the process of discussing it with the prosecutor, saying, be aware, that's all. How do you wanna handle this? Uh, to me, that's the way to do it. I think sometimes we just assume that they know. Oh, excuse new. me. I know. Repeat that again. I, <laughs> I, had a little trouble I think sometimes you we assume, just assume that they know. You are a scientist. They know you assume that stuff. a lawyer yeah. knows anything? Well, or we're hoping it doesn't come up, you know. It just, you know. I, you know, they fly you out to, to the, your old state and you have five minutes to look over your old report and right, you right. realize on the I, stand, I, you look, know, it's old. One of the other know. things we talked about when we did the impression and pattern evidence symposium here is the absolute need, and it's, it's sad that the burden falls on you all, that you all have to school the lawyers, right? 
We all know that. Some labs have model questions written out for the lawyers. Uh, please, and I say this, don't assume that lawyers know science. The last statistics I saw, they were a couple of years old, were that maybe 5% of the people going to law school have a science background. Ooh, that's a bad number, right? So don't assume that just because I don't think it's there. Now, some really good offices, like a Christine Funk has this set up uh, in Delaware, where I teach at their public defender's office. They have a forensics unit in the office. They'll learn that stuff. Some prosecution offices have a point person. There's a great, great lawyer, now a judge from Mountain California, Woody Clark. Woody has no science background, but learned all about DNA, wrote a great book. Also, I don't remember the name of the book, but if you just look up Woody Clark with an E, um, a great book about the history of DNA coming into the courtroom. Um, and Woody was involved in all sorts of cases. So there are places that have that kind of specialization, but I think that's the exception, not the rule. Well, I did have enough slides. So where's Debbie? Because I think we're supposed to do with whoever else you want, just a general Q&A now? Or are we doing the, the Twitcher thing? Shh, clickers. Like everybody get their clicker out. Anyway, Thanks for letting me fly in here at midnight last night and leave immediately after this. And I salute you for all the great work that you do. Thank you.